We're going to spend a few moments in prayer, but before we do, I want to read our call to worship again. I want to read that to us. It's Matthew 9, 37 through 38. Matthew 9, 37 through 38. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful. It is abounded, uh, abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now, God is sending out workers into his harvest from this church. This is actually the prayer that we were asked when we gathered together with Oregon Trail Baptist Association. We were asked to pray this in the morning and the evening of every day that the Lord would send out workers into the harvest. And that harvest being here in Nebraska, as we realize that there are very few workers. I know that there are few people, but still, even in the few people, we need the workers. The same and maybe worse in Alaska. We need workers for the fields. And praise God that he is sending them out from this church. And we're praising the Lord for that. Now, as Corey mentioned earlier, Alaska is two and one-third times the size of Texas. A Texas-sized area of the state has a hundred villages where there are no evangelical churches. Imagine that. A Texas-sized area with no evangelical churches. Churches that preach the gospel. So we have a mission field. We have our marching orders. And we're going to take it on. And we're going to go. We're going to send missionaries. We're going to go if we can. We're going to send missionaries. We're going to help in every way possible to spread the gospel in this dark and dying world. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father. Right now we come to you, we thank you that you are God, and Lord, as I was just teaching the children, that you are our only God, you are our, oh, the only one that we can go to, that we can speak to for help. You are our helper, and so Lord, we look to you. The task before us is too great. God, we need you to provide we need you to provide the workers. We need you to provide the finances. We need you to provide, Lord, the prayers. We need you to raise up people who will pray and who will lift up those that you're sending and the mission field that you're sending us on. And so, Lord, we ask that you do that. Lord, we have other requests as well. I want to continue to lift up Karen Polson, Lord. I know that she's, even this morning, in great pain from uh, the oral surgery that she's had. We lift her to you. We ask that you strengthen her body. You bring her some peace from this pain as well. Lord, I also lift up Darla. I know Darla Kirchel is having some issues in her mouth as well uh, with uh, teeth issues. And so, Lord, we lift her to you as well. Lord, I do pray for Noah as he is struggling with sickness. I don't know if it's the flu or what, Lord, but we lift him to you. And, Lord, I want to praise you this morning that Ray White was able to return here and be with us this morning. I thank you for how well the surgery went and, and his recovery. And just talking to him this morning and seeing and hearing the excitement in him uh, that this has worked to, to alleviate much of the pain that he had in his hips. And Lord, I want to thank you for Alice. And I know how hard it must be to, to work and, and to help someone who is, who is recovering from surgery. And so, Lord, continue to strengthen her as well as she meets the need there of ministering to, uh, uh, to Ray, Lord. Lord, we do want to lift up uh, Donna's grandson, Colton. And uh, we also pray for Janet, Alice's sister-in-law, and Natasha, Ray White's granddaughter. You know the needs in each of these situations. We lift them to you, Lord. We ask that you touch them, that you bring your healing touch, whether it's physical, whether it's spiritual, whether it's both. We ask that you be there. And God, as we shift our attention here, Lord, back to the book of Genesis, Lord, we ask that you rain down upon us your Holy Spirit, that you open our minds and our eyes, our spiritual ears, our spiritual eyes, our spiritual minds, that we might understand and grasp your word. 
Speak, let it not be my word. Speak in spite of me, Lord, a vile, wretched man. But Lord, I believe that you can speak through me and in spite of me. And I pray that you will. Let your Holy Spirit be here with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to think about this for a moment. Just think and imagine this for a moment. After the floodwaters receded, after the animals left the ark, and after Noah and his family are standing on dry land again, Noah and his family have the task of starting all over again. Can you imagine this? Imagine, put yourself in their shoes. Now, remember the water was 20 to 24 feet above the highest mountain. Now, that's got to do something to the landscape. Remember the water came up from under the ground, and it came down from the heavens, and it came down in just a roaring, rushing fashion. So we've got this going on. So all of the contour of the land is changing. It's going to be completely different. And let's just say that Noah could have kept that ark in one spot. It doesn't move. It doesn't float anywhere. It just stayed, which it didn't. Obviously, it ends up on Mount Ariat. But let's just say he could have kept it in one place. And it just, the water goes down, goes away, and it dries out, and he comes out in the same place. It's not going to be the same place, is it? It's going to be completely different. Everyone, every animal that's not in that ark with him, everyone that was on this earth is gone. All, of, all that they have created, all of culture, everything, roads, everything is gone. So he's walking out with his family and all of these animals into a brand new world. Now you and I sometimes, we have to start over. I had to move five years ago, almost five years ago, out here 1,400 miles away from where I grew up and lived pretty much my entire life. So that was kind of starting over, but it's not the same. You know, you have all kinds of infrastructure here. We have roads. We have stores. We have the things it takes to survive. Noah and his family didn't have that. They're starting completely and utterly over. So when Noah came out of the ark, he was like a second Adam, about to usher in a new beginning for the human race. Now, faith in the Lord had saved Noah. It had saved his household from certain destruction. And his three sons, they would repopulate the entire earth. Now, keep in mind that this passage here before us this morning, Genesis chapter 9, the first 17 verses here, is all about God. And I like to talk about that quite often in this church. Everything in this life is all about God. It's not about us. When we gather to worship, even on a Sunday morning, it's not about us. It's all about God and His glory. But this passage here in particular is all about God. He's the only person who speaks and acts. Noah doesn't say a thing and he doesn't do anything either. God is the subject, he is the actor, and he is the initiator. Now he establishes here a new beginning. He puts forth a new command, he gives a new promise, and he establishes a new covenant. Now, in our passage this morning, God addresses the eight survivors of the flood, and he gave them instructions concerning four areas of life. So God addresses the survivors of the flood, namely Noah, of course, and his family. He addresses them, and he gives them instructions concerning four areas of life. Now, I want us to talk about those this morning. But we're going to begin with, we're going to start with, God gave instructions concerning future descendants or on multiplying life. So God gives instructions on how they are to repopulate the earth. So let's look here in chapter 9. We're going to look at verse 1, and then we're going to skip on down to verse 7. So beginning in verse 1, and then skipping down to verse 7. So verse 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth. Verse 7, 
and you be fruitful and multiply. Increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Now, if these two verses sound familiar to you, there's a reason for that. It was spoken to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. This is Eden all over again. Be fruitful and multiply. Just what he had said to Adam and Eve, the first man, the first woman, he is saying here to Noah and his family. God commissions Noah and his family to spread out across the earth and to reestablish human civilization. Now, just as Adam was the head of the human race in the beginning, Noah is now the head of the reconstituted human race after the flood. So all of Noah's descendants were important to the plan of God, but especially the line of Shem. From that line, Abraham would be born, the man God chose to found the Jewish nation, and from that nation would come the eventual Redeemer who would fulfill Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. He would crush the serpent's head. So God gave instructions concerning the future descendants on multiplying on the earth. God tells Noah and his family to be fruitful and multiply. Secondly, God gave instructions concerning diet or on sustaining life. So what is Noah, what is going to be Noah and his family's diet? So God gives instruction here on their diet. How are they going to eat? What is going to sustain them as they are leaving this ark and entering a new world. So look at verses 2 through 4. Verses 2 through 4. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every more, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. When God established Adam and Eve in their garden home, He gave them fruit, He gave them plants, He gave them grain to eat. But after the flood, He expanded the human diet to include meat. Now the harmony in nature that Adam and Eve had enjoy, enjoyed was gone. For Noah and his family, they didn't have the dominion over animal life. Now the animals here would fear humans and do everything possible to escape the threat of death. Since most animals reproduce rapidly and their young mature quickly, the beast could easily overrun the human population. So God put the fear of humans into animals. Noah and his sons become hunters. Following the flood, man would no longer be a vegetarian. However, God put one restriction on the eating of animal flesh. The meat must be free of blood. This meat, if you're going to kill an animal, must be free of blood before you eat it. God said to Noah what he would later give in detail to Moses, that the life is in the blood and the life, it must be respected. Now, in this restriction, God revealed again his concern for animal life. The life is in the blood, and the life comes from God, and it should be respected. Now, furthermore, the blood of animals would be important in most of the mosaic sacrifices, so the blood must be treated with reverence. This also shows, of course, respect for God. So God gave instructions concerning diet on sustaining life. Now what was added to the diet was meat. They could eat meat. Thirdly, God gave instructions concerning discipline or on protecting life. Now if you know anything about the world before the flood, you would understand this completely. The world was full of violence, man killing man, everyone killing each other. It was just full of hate and violence. And so God gives instruction concerning discipline or on protecting life. So look at verses 5 and 6. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, 
By man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. From instructing Noah about the shedding of animal blood, the Lord proceeded here to discuss an even more important topic, the shedding of human blood. Thus far, mankind hadn't had a very good track record when it came to caring for one another. Remember, Cain kills his brother Abel. And then we have Lamech kills a young man, and then he boasts about his killing of this young man. The earth had been filled with all kinds of violence. Now God had put fear of humans into animals, but he also must put the fear of God into humans, lest they destroy one another as they were doing before the flood. So those who kill their fellow, their fellow man will have to answer to God for their deeds. For men and women were made in the image of God. To attack a human being is to basically attack God, and the Lord will bring judgment on those who do so. All of life is a gift from God, and to take away, take away life means to take the place of God. The Lord gives life, and he alone has the right to take it. According to the law of Moses, if an animal killed a human, the animal was to be put to death. If the animal was known to be dangerous but wasn't pinned up, then the owner of the animal was in danger of his own life being taken. Yes, that would include dangerous dogs. Again, the Lord gives life, and he alone has the right to authorize its taking. This is the biblical foundation here in chapter 9 of the book of Genesis for capital punishment. This is the biblical foundation for capital punishment. In this passage, God delegates to human authority the right to take life in certain circumstances. Later on in the Old Testament, God will specify certain circumstances where the death penalty is justified. The death penalty was prescribed for murder. If you take someone's life, your life is to be taken. Uh, the death penalty was prescribed for working on the Sabbath, for cursing your father or mother, for adultery or sodomy or rape or kidnapping. It should be observed that each of these crimes constitutes an assault on God's law or on one of God's institutions. And God's institutions is the marriage and family or upon a person created in God's image. God gave these laws to the Jews for the sake of purity and holiness. God arranged to punish murderers and to see that justice is done and that the law is upheld by establishing human government on the earth. Human government and capital punishment go together. Romans chapter 13, this is in the New Testament, Romans chapter 13, the first seven verses talk about human government along with capital punishment. Romans 13, 4 tells us that when a civil authority that a judge, a police officer, a soldier, etc., acts to uphold righteousness and to punish evildoers, he does not bear the sword in vain. That sword of punishment, which includes a capital punishment, is part of God's judgment against those who do evil, especially those who take innocent life. Now, opponents of capital punishment ask this question, they ask, does capital punishment really deter crime? Well, that's not even a good question because if God establishes it, does it matter whether you think it does or not? But does capital punishment deter crime? But does any law deter crime? We have a law on speeding. Most of us have gained a ticket at some point for speeding. So laws do deter crime to a certain extent, of course, but sometimes they don't. Perhaps not as much as we desire, but the punishment of offenders does help society to honor law and justice. Nobody knows how much a person learns when they are convicted and then thinks twice before disobeying the law again. The law also helps to protect and compensate innocent people who are victims of lawless behavior. Not everything that is legal is biblical. Regardless of what some courts may say, God's mandate of capital punishment begins with whoever. Whoever takes the life of someone else, their life is to be taken. 
It was given by God to be respected and obeyed by all people. So God gave instructions concerning discipline or on protecting life. He was not going to allow Noah and his family to come off this ark to repopulate the earth and everything be the same as it was before. He wanted to make sure that there was discipline there. Fourthly and finally, God gave instructions concerning his covenant. God gave instructions concerning his covenant. So look at verses 8 through 17. Let's read verses 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for all generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it, and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that's on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So first, God made a covenant with creation. God made a covenant with creation. This section is what theologians call the Noahic covenant. Now in this covenant... God promised unconditionally that he would never again send another flood to destroy all life on the earth. As though to make it emphatic, three times he said, never again, never again, never again. He didn't lay any, any conditions down at this point that men and women had to obey. He simply stated the fact that there would be no more universal floods. Never again. At least four times in this covenant, the Lord mentioned every living creature. Now, he was speaking about the animals and the birds that Noah had kept safe in the ark during the flood. And once again, we're reminded of God's special concern for animal life. So God made a covenant with creation. Secondly, he gives a covenant sign. He makes a covenant with creation, and then he gives a covenant sign. To help people remember his covenants, God would give them a visible sign. Now remember back with Abraham, his covenant with Abraham, that he sealed with the sign of circumcision. The Mosaic covenant at Sinai, he sealed with the sign of the weekly Sabbath. And God's covenant with Noah here, the Noahic covenant with the animals and Noah was sealed with the sign of the rainbow. Whenever people saw the rainbow, they would remember God's promise that no future storm would ever become worldwide. It would never become a worldwide flood that would destroy all of humanity. So God makes a covenant. He makes a covenant with creation. He makes a sign or he gives a sign, the rainbow, that he's made this covenant. That he will never again destroy all of the earth by flood. Now we make covenants as well, do we not? We make covenants as well. In, in fact, most of you have entered into a covenant with someone else. When I perform a marriage, I ask the bride and groom if they have rings. And the reason that I do that is these rings are to seal their marriage covenant. As husbands and wives, we need reminding of the covenant of marriage that we made before God. If one in the couple, couple is tempted to be unfaithful, they need only to look to their ring and be reminded of the covenant that they made before God. As believers in Christ, we need reminders, reminders of our new covenant in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 11, we're told that the Lord gave us the Lord's Supper 
as a covenant sign since we belong to Jesus Christ. Now Christ gave his life for us so that we could live for and in him. Christ gave his life so that we could live for him and in him. Now the only way that you can live for Christ is to be in Christ. How are you in Christ? How can someone be in Christ? Just like Noah could go into the ark and be safe, there was his salvation. This ark would protect him from the floodwaters so we can be in Christ that will protect us from the judgment to come. How do we do that? Well, we have to believe something. Now, that belief goes beyond just head knowledge. It goes to the heart and transforms a life. We believe that God sent his son. He came to this earth. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He grew up, he lived a sinless life. The Bible says that he never sinned, that he died for sinners, but there was no sin found in him. The Bible says he went to the cross. He was the propitiation. That means that he was the wrath bearer for us. He took God's wrath that is against sin. He died on that cross for your sin and my sin, for those who would believe the Bible says he was buried, the third day resurrected. In the book of Romans, it says if you will confess Jesus and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you'll confess that he is Lord. The Bible also says that he walked this earth for 40 days, revealing himself to his disciples. And then he ascended into heaven where he is king, he is Lord, he is master. And if you will believe upon him as king, lord, and master, if you will come off the throne room of your life, and Jesus will be on the throne of your life, the Bible says you'll be saved. It talks about repentance. Let me, let me explain what repentance is. Repentance is I'm turning from my sin, and I'm turning to Jesus' righteousness. So you must repent. You must turn away from following my own way. I'm going my own direction. I'm doing my own thing. I'm disobeying God. And I turn and I receive Christ's righteousness. That he lived a perfect life in my place. He died a perfect death. He was resurrected. He is seated at God's right hand. He is king. He is Lord. He is master. And if you will repent and receive Christ Jesus, the Bible says that you will be in Christ. And therefore, if you're in Christ, you can live for Christ. Now, that's only by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Because if you trust in Christ, if you believe upon Christ, the Bible says that we're given the Holy Spirit. He comes and lives within us. And as he lives within us, he gives us the ability to live a life that honors God. I hope and pray that you're in Christ. And if you are in Christ, that you're living for Christ. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, I pray that there is not one here today that doesn't know whether they're in Christ. If they don't, Lord, I pray that they will receive Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior. There may be some that know that they're not in Christ. I pray that they will receive Christ Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. But Lord, I also want to pray for everyone who is in Christ that we will live for Christ, that we will live lives that honor Christ, that we will live out the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that those will be in our life and they will be growing as fruit. I pray for that, Lord. I thank you this morning, as 2 Timothy 3.16 says, that your word is profitable for teaching for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. I pray that you have done that in our lives this morning. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now receive the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Thank you for being here this morning.